Next, let's ask ourselves, will demography overwhelm our fiscal, economic, and global position? Will debt and taxes lead to Japanese or European-style stagnation? This, I believe, is the most important of these questions for your generation, and perhaps the most important, maybe even by a sizable amount, of all of these, although education, which I'll get to in a moment, is close behind. So let's take a look at what's going on. And to do that, I want to remind you, I'm not putting up any equations deliberately, but I'll remind you from your economics one that the distortions, waste, inefficiency, harm done by taxes, because every tax winds up distorting some decision. An income tax distorts decisions to work or save. The corporate income tax distorts incentives to invest. The payroll tax may affect work incentives. Sales taxes may affect what you buy and whether you work, things of that sort. The harm goes up with the square of the tax rate. If you double the tax rate, it quadruples the harm. This isn't some conservative concoction. It's, it has to do with areas under demand and supply curves from your Econ 1 class. Keeping marginal tax rates relatively low is extremely important to the efficient functioning of the economy. And secondly, the government has, over the long run, a budget constraint, which eventually it's going to have to pay its bills. It may be able to postpone that, in the case of the US, for an considerable, additional considerable period of time. But eventually, taxes will have to be raised, or other spending growth slowed or turned negative to deal with these liabilities, or Interest rates will start to rise as people get more and more worried about holding more and more sovereign debt of the US or any other country. So that, that's an intertemporal budget constraint, which states that the present value of revenue this seems to have gone on. There we go. Must, in the end, cover the present value of spending. It doesn't tell us exactly when that much must occur. It could, that present value could go out over a long period of time. But some countries have gotten in trouble very rapidly. The Greeks, for instance. Many people are worried about Italy now and what that might mean for the euro. So debt and taxes are important. And there is some fundamental arithmetic underneath all this. The final equation I'll tell you about is that when you have a pay-as-you-go finance uh, welfare or transfer system or social insurance system where taxes on today's workers pay the benefits to people who are collecting them, retire workers and retirees for social security, but more generally the tax paying public versus people collecting the benefits. The tax rate necessary to pay for it is the product of two simple ideas. The dependency ratio, the ratio of people collecting to people working, and the replacement rate, how generous the benefits are relative to the, the tax base wages, for example, under the payroll tax. You can't get around that arithmetic. You can dodge it for a while, but the present value of those numbers must add up. And we'll see some more about that. So it's something to, to think about as we have this discussion. It isn't just the politics of left and right or efficiency versus equity. There's some deep fundamental math that is very simple that cannot be gotten around permanently by a government. Okay. So let's take a look at some of these issues. Okay. The top panel here shows what's going on in the demography as the dependency ratio, the ratio of people retired to the working age population, about doubles from a decade or two ago. And so rough numbers were going from uh, three and a quarter workers to around two workers per retiree, a little, a little more than that, 2.3 or something like that. And if we look at the bottom panel, we'll see the most rapidly growing group in the population are people over the age of six, seven, 85, second most 75, third most 65. And the working age population is growing slowly. Now those over 85s are from a low base, but life expectancy has been rising. One reason our social insurance programs are straining. 
In fact, life expectancy has gone up for, for once you reach 65, has gone up a month a year for 40 years. It's like every year we live, we get a bonus month. So if that continues, again, we'll have a lot more four-generation families alive simultaneously. That's what this chart is showing. So imagine your parents at their peak of their earnings years are putting you through college. They ha uh, you have grandparents in nursing. And then you start having babies. And that's what's going on. Not just a strain on government finances, but it will create all sorts of pressure within families across generations. And it will affect the saving and insurance and location and work decisions uh, that they make. So this is pretty fundamental. It's a huge force. It, it happens gradually. But to show how important it is, even our most fundamental data we're using to describe the economy now have to be conditioned on demography. I'll give you two. It's been, it's been stated that wages are growing very slowly. But it turns out that the baby boom generation has been retiring in record numbers for the last few years. And they tend to be kind of at the peak or just below the peak of their earnings. And younger workers are working for lower starting salaries than they are, even though those younger workers may over their lifetime do better. And in fact, likely will. So what does that all mean? It means if you take the average, you're taking the average unconditioned on age, the mix is changing. And if everything was going along as before, the rate of growth of wages should naturally slow because of this. Same thing happens if you look at median income. So just to be a little cautious about these averages at a time when by historical standards pretty rapidly with the retirement of the baby boom generation. If we look at federal spending projections, Social Security by far the largest spending item and probably the most popular in the federal budget and Medicare are just gigantic. And they're growing rapidly. Okay. We see the Congressional Budget Office projects that Social Security will quadruple, more than quadruple, and Medicare will, uh, will grow by a factor of five or more over the next generation. If we look at Medicare, Medicaid, and Social Security and look at the right bars here, net of, inter net of interest, they're a growing part of the budget and they're projected to reach almost 70% of the budget just for those three programs. It's often said, again, somewhat misleadingly, this is all up due to boomers retiring. That simply isn't so. The system is designed with rising real benefits per beneficiary by the formulas that are used to project benefits. And leaving aside any remaining uh, overstatement of inflation by the indexing formulas, even if we accept the, the data is correct, the next generation, when it retires, will receive benefits roughly 40% higher than the previous generation, and for a longer period of time. The 75-year unfunded liabilities, and this will be remarkable when I say this is, the, this is the better half of the news, because start, in year 76, these programs are still running very large deficits, and there's another, you know, every year beyond that is a deficit, so the present value out to the distant or the, the far distant future, uh, is even worse, we see that 75-year un unfunded liabilities are larger than the national debt. And for Medicare, they're more than twice the debt. So that's going to have to be paid. It is already, these are already affecting the rest of the budget. The rest of the budget's being squeezed. And our, perhaps our most important national priority, national defense, has in particular been squeezed. There's been temporary relief for two years um, from the sequester caps. That's probably better than the alternative of not having that relief for a military that's deeply stretched. However, it's a big problem when you can't have consistent regular funding and they have to spend a lot of money right away, then cut back, et cetera. It's not a very efficient way to run a budget or the military. If we ask how high tax rates will go, when you guys are in your peak earning years, 
out there, say, in 2048. I know that seems a distant future. That's more than double. However, you will be in your peak earning years in roughly 30 years. And if we take, this is just for California, the numbers would be slightly smaller for other states because California has a very high income tax. If we take top wage earners, they're going to go from paying over 50% at the margin right now to over 80% at the margin, just to cover the spending in these programs, if we expand income and payroll taxes to do that. Middle income taxpayers will wind up moving from 40 what, 46% to well over 60%. So think just abstract of all the econometric studies and so on, and ask yourself, what does it mean for a society that a, a large percentage, a majority of its working families are minority partners at the margin in their own labor? We've never experienced anything remotely like that in the United States or anywhere else, any other free society. So it's very hard to envision a robust economy unless we start to get the spending growth, especially on entitlements, under control. And this is what would happen. Likely future incomes would be 15% or more below projected levels that they would automatically be. And for perspective, they fell 5% in the Great Recession, although admittedly abruptly rather than just gradually. That would be the answer. Okay. All right. Will our labor for force be well enough educated, have the necessary skills? Will we have enough workers? Right now, everybody seems totally convinced that AI and a variety of other things will disemploy so many people that we have to figure out some way to support the large bulk of the labor force for whom work will be unnecessary as robots do everything and software does everything. I think that's a great exaggeration. An analogous set of arguments was made in the early days of computers. The cover of every business magazine had something like the following story. There's somebody sitting at a keyboard, key punching cards for input into IBM mainframes. And there's another side of the picture of a bunch of family, apparently family relatives, et cetera, at home, and he's the only one working. And the basic idea was automation, which was what it was called at the time, would disemploy most people. The lucky few would program or key punch for IBM, and everybody else would be disemployed. Well, that never happened. Yes, the labor force is always being uprooted, but a flexible, dynamic economy has opportunities for those workers to find other jobs, sometimes not for as good a pay, sometimes in a different location, sometimes for better pay. But as a general matter, uh, the labor force is going to have to adapt to these things, and we've seen many examples of it. Is there a guarantee this will happen with the new wave of artificial intelligence and robots and so on, 3D printing? We'll see. My own, my own guess is it's likely to be less of a disruption than people are, are suggesting. But what about how, how high quality the skills and education of our labor force? If we look at international comparisons of test scores, what do we see? We see the United States has a low, below average, average test score, has fewer high performers, fewer people like you, and many more low performers. Now, Many of these other places undoubtedly teach to the test, and test scores have lots of issues. But as a general proposition, uh, we see our K through 12 education system is not sufficient to generate the skills for college entry for a large enough fraction of our labor force. There are many reasons for this. Not all the schools fault. Not you know the teachers' unions. Yes, they cause lots of problems. Uh, you can't get rid of bad teachers, and they get funneled into underperforming schools. But also, there's a variety of things, and many more people are being raised outside normal uh, familial relationships with less supervision. They have less auxiliary resources at home to supplement what goes on in schools, et cetera. 
So we're going to have to make a major improvement. Time, over time, over a very long time span, major improvements on this score will be reflected in generationally in better skills later on. And the longer we wait, the longer it will be before we do that, and the bit more at risk we'll have for a larger and larger fraction of the population to be un- or counterproductive. But currently, the economy is doing really well on this score, with one exception. Firms are having a hard time firing, finding qualified workers. American firms today list more job openings than there are unemployed people. That's a remarkable statistic. It also suggests that there's something of a mismatch in some of the unemployed looking for work don't have the right skills to get the job openings. These job openings are not mostly software engineers. They're things like electricians, tool and die operators, a variety of other skills that require maybe a modest training program or a modest year or two of community college done right. So those are open questions and I view the problem of get, fixing our K through 12 education system as second only to fixing our fiscal future. But I think it's a harder problem conceptually to get the improvement. We, we, know, we know a bit about what works. It's really difficult politically to get it enacted. Uh, there was a great idea to have uh, championed by the late Milton Friedman to give people vouchers, let them choose their schools, have competition pressure the improvement as it does everywhere else. But the monopoly of the labor teachers unions and uh, the bureaucrats and the administrative apparatus in the states seem to have mostly thwarted that. We've had, we've had some of the chartered schools doing. And the original hope was the learnings from that would transfer over the public system, but that has not yet occurred. Fifth, we are in the midst of a major energy revolution and potential serious environmental problems. The traditional environmental problems of air and water pollution have been greatly reduced through a variety of technology, efficiency, and some uh, regulation. The remaining major potential problem is climate change, and there's a lot of controversy about the pace of that, what's likely to happen, and what to do about it. My own view is there has been some modest warming of the planet. It apparently cools from around 1940 to the late 1970s and has warmed since then. There's a big argument whether it's flattened out since 1998 or has picked up again and the data or what correction should be made. But in any event, this is a potential problem, especially on a generational scale. And we see lots of issues in countries trying to deal with uh, slowing the rate of growth of emissions, and even bigger problems in international uh, cooperation in this score because carbon, the, the problem is the amount of carbon, generally greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, and it doesn't much matter where they're coming. Burning a lot of coal as they develop, um, that's going to continue to add, even as the U.S. has been doing relatively well by the other aspect of the energy revolution. And that's been the energy renaissance, which has been enabled by fracking primarily on private property. The combination of uh, hydro hydraulic uh, fracturing, etc., has created a situation where America has become quite competitive again in producing oil. We're close to or just surpassed the Saudis and the Russians now. And remarkably, we've basically doubled U.S. oil production in a few years, even as existing fields are declining. But importantly for the environment, we have subbed out a lot of coal with inexpensive natural gas from fracking. For some time, and that has enabled many utilities and others to switch from coal to natural gas and generating electricity. There's also a bit of a growth of renewables. And while there's a lot of discussion about wind and solar, um, they are at most a niche product for a considerable length of time. The International Energy Association 
predicts um, that over the next generation, if wind and solar double and double again, they'll amount to a little more than 5% of global energy. So people don't realize how vast the global energy market and industry is. And it's not going to be easy to, with policies of subsidies, mandates, tax breaks, et cetera, which we give, which we give at the federal and state level in the United States and the like, it will not be easy to sub out more traditional sources of energy very quickly in most parts of the world and of the United States. This is our exports of crude oil, which are basically non-existent until recently. And these are the primary energy demand with a, the new policy scenario by the International Energy Association. And what that means is if we, if we continue to look at the policies people are suggesting they're going to take and assume they're implemented and have the, a predicted effect, that's already embedded in these numbers. And you can take a look at how coal has gradually falling, but not very much. Okay. In total amount. Okay. Then if we look at what would be required to meet the two degree Celsius target that, so compare this chart to this chart. And you see, even with, so it would take a great acceleration of existing policies and far more breakthroughs in technology than currently envisioned. The, the previous graph already includes some technological advances to deal with these problems. Sixth, 